Okay. Welcome to the EL, ELD MOOC. Welcome to this first live event on the economics of land degradation. I am Claudia Musekamp and I'm your host for this event. I'm also the online tutor for the entire MOOC. I am based in Berlin, so welcome from Berlin for this uh, exciting um, afternoon session on the economics of land degradation. As a newbie, I'm a newbie to the field of sustainable land management. Um, as a newbie, I have to say I'm very delighted uh, to be surrounded, to be hosting so many experts like you, uh, experts from the field of land management, from the field of uh, sustainability. I'm very glad uh, to have the opportunity to learn so much about uh, land management all over the world. As an online tutor, I'm equally delighted uh, to see how many of you have already made friends on the MOOC platform, how many have already shared thoughts uh, in the uh, forum or in the Teams um, section. And I was also very delighted to see how many of you have already done the first assignment, uh, sharing ideas or sharing uh, their story of the land they value and uh, love. Um, the land we value, that's uh, today's topic. The land we value in, in many respects. Uh, this is to this afternoon topics. We will be talking for, uh, the whole session will be for about an hour. And any questions you have, them down in the chat box and we'll take them uh, later in the session. Um, today I'm very delighted to have uh, two distinguished speakers on board, Mr. Mark Schauer of the ELD initiative based in Bonn. Uh, Mr. Mark Schauer um, is the head of the Economics of Land Degradation Initiative. He holds a master's degree in forest management. He has worked in, um, in Europe, in Africa and Asia and um, has been working with the uh, initiative TEEB uh, that probably uh, many of you are familiar with. Um, I'm also very delighted uh, to welcome Dr. Emmanuel Kileru. Emmanuel Kileru, Dr. Kileru is based in Canada. She is with the United Nations University Institute um, for Water, Environment and Health. She holds a um, PhD um, from the University of Kent in Agri Environmental Economics, long uh, title, uh, and he also holds a master's degree in, in environmental economics from the Imperial College in the UK. So welcome uh, Dr. Schauer, welcome Dr. Kileru to this uh, session on economics of land degradation. Uh, what's on the agenda today? Um, we'll have Mark Schauer and Dr. Kiruru talk about the ELD initiative. Uh, we learn more about the approach of economics, of viewing, valuing um, a land from an economical perspective and uh, Dr. Kilaru will introduce us to the six steps that uh, the um, ELD method is composed of. Uh, after the presentations we'll have a question and uh, answers, answers session. Um, before I um, uh, 
uh, hand over to uh, today's speakers, I would like uh, to ask you something that we already ask you a little bit uh, in the intake survey. Um, when you decided uh, to take this MOOC, what did you expect from this MOOC? Um, would you say, um, oh, that was deleted. Okay, we, I think we need to uh, skip this uh, uh, question. So I will um, hand over to, uh, directly to uh, Mark Schauer. Mark, please take over. I'm not, uh, so he is. Thank you. Okay, I've just stopped the mic. Can you hear me okay? Um, okay. Okay, can you hear me okay now like this, like this now? Can you give me a thumbs up if that's there is? You can hear me? I can't hear, I can't hear, I can't hear. Can you hear me okay like this now? Still no. Like this, better, 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 better. Can you hear me now? Yeah? Is that okay? Yeah? Can I start talking? Okay. I can't hear you anyway. But anyway, I assume that I'll assume that I'm okay now here. Okay. One minute. Like this? Can you hear me okay? Yes? I see Claudia nodding. Okay, let's assume that I'm online now and that you can hear me. Emma is kind of... Yeah. Okay, um, thank you Claudia for the introduction and I'm sorry that I'm struggling with the technique here. Um, thanks for the encouraging feedback I see there in the chat. Yes, much better. Yes, yes, you can hear me okay? Okay, very good. Um, thank you all for joining. I see that there's more than 80 people joining us right now um, from all over the world. Fabulous. And um, I'm happy to introduce you today quickly into what the ELD initiative is, what we do, why it is important, what we'd like to achieve with the initiative, where we are at the moment, and um, what the link with the MOOC and uh, is and what we'd like to achieve through the MOOC for the ELD initiative as well. So, what is the ELD initiative? Let me get in media here. The ELD initiative has been initiated by a number of political partners, by the German Ministry for Development and foremost by United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification, UNCCD. I see a number of colleagues from UNCCD are joining us as well here. Um, and the European Commission right from the start. And it was initiated to achieve more awareness for the growing issue of land degradation. With land degradation 
becoming a threat in an increasing number of countries throughout the world and a threat for development especially. The part, as I just mentioned, um, decided that they would like to start an initiative similar to maybe the TEEP study, which you've just heard, the Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity. Claudia mentioned I was engaged in that earlier. And uh, maybe similar also to the Stern study, which raised awareness probably for the first time in this, um, in this amount or in this context that there is a large cost linked to climate change as well. So we'd like to point out here that there is a large cost, economic cost linked with um, the loss of land, the loss of soil as well. And we point out with ELD that um, it is worth investing into sustainable land management practices there. ELD proposes effective solutions in the end, policies and activities to reduce land degradation as well, worldwide. In an effort linked with that to facilitate development and to fight poverty. Why is that important? Because we think that the numbers, some of you might have had a chance to have a look at the materials we, which we prepared for the MOOC. Um, so the numbers are in there. These are frightening numbers which you see that the loss of land, loss of land which can be used or which is crucial for the production of um, food for fiber, for, nat for some natural resources which are essential for development as well and for livelihoods and for living of people all over the world is decreasing at an alarming rate. And um, often through man-made activities and management activities. And this is where ELD comes in and where we'd like to show, or where we can show now with our first results from our scientific and economic work behind the initiative, that uh, what the value of this loss is, what the value of the existing land is maybe, and also what it's, why it's worth, as I said, investing in sustainable activities. And with these data, we'd like to go forward and engage political partners, private sector decision makers, as well as um, our partners from the scientific community, and um, create A, awareness, and B, allow for a better decision-making process then, in the end. Our objective is to do this all on the basis of an inclusive partnership. We call on scientists, on economists, and experts from all over the world, um, from business and policy, to cooperate in the ELD network. And, well, <laughs> without wanting to pat myself on the shoulder here, I think we've made um, a very good um, progress so far with building up an extensive network of partners, of contributors um, within the ELD network there. Obviously, there is a growing interest out there to and a growing awareness as well for the upcoming or the growing issue of uh, the loss of soil, the loss of land, the loss of this non-renewable resource and also an interest to influence decisions on this through economic arguments as well. Um, the ELD initiative engages in cooperation with universities and research institutions most notably, I'd like to mention here again, thanks to Emma, and to Richard Thomas, who will be on this MOOC as well later on, um, with the United Nations University uh, in Toronto, um, um, Institute for Water, Environment and Health, who are responsible for the scientific coordination of the overall initiative, and who are doing a fabulous job on keeping ELD scientifically sound and on track there key partners for the success of the initiative. We engage also with other, an, a large number of other research institu institutions in Europe, but also um, in Asia, US, Africa, Southern America, you name it, there will be an ELD partner institution somewhere there. Um, we're engaging with NGOs, obviously, um, because they are dealing with 
food security development issues, smallholder farmer issues as well. International businesses are our partners as well because they are often very crucial for achieving changes in the uh, land management overall. And we'll have, and this is why I just wrote to um, our friend from the Netherlands there, that we'll have a meeting for the private sector here in Bonn next week where we will engage people, um, decision makers from the private sector with ELD ideas and approaches there. <coughs> Sorry, why are we doing this? Because um, an, uh, an objective or a vector for our messages are the ELD reports. They will be pre prepared for the first half of 2015 and successively released throughout the first half of next year. Um, they include a report for the scientific community, which describes methodology, approaches, data collection, and scenario building um, methods as well. Connected to that, or based on this, we are preparing reports for decision makers from policy and from the private sector as well. Trying to find the right language and the right arguments to speak to decision makers from these two sectors there and convince with our arguments that sustainable land management pays off and that soil is a valuable resource. So far, if we're looking at the current stage of development of the ELD, I just mentioned a number of partners there. Um, we have built up the ELD initiative on two pillars. One is the policy partnership, which includes the founding partners, as, as I mentioned them in the beginning. Um, but, but it also includes um, the Korean Forest Service so far. It includes um, a number of um, business um, enterprises getting engaged here and um, individual experts as well. On the other pillar, we see a science partnership there, um, coordinated by United Nations University, notably Emma and Richard here. Um, the ELD working groups, some of you might have had a look at our organic RAM on our, on our website, for example, are the core for, these, for the work there. There are three working groups there, one being um, organized by Stockholm Environment Institute and coordinated by Stacy Noel. Stacy will be on this MOOC um, later in the process as well. There's um, a working group on options and pathways for, um, for action. That's the one Stacy is handling. We have one on data and methodology. That is handled by Bob Costanza and his team. And um, one of his team, Ida, she'd be on the call here as well. So you will have a chance throughout the MOOC to talk more in detail on the scientific approach there. The third um, group is the economic valuation of options, which, it, which is handled by Pushpam Kumar, an old friend of mine who was with us with TEEP and who's helping us here in the ELD process as well. Within these working groups, experts come together and help us to develop methodology, work on case studies to fill gaps in the gap analysis which we have conducted, and generally find a joint approach for um, the ELD work. In support to these um, processes, we have a number of additional supporting processes running, Mm, most notably probably through the Center for Development Research based here in Bonn and in cooperation with IFPRI, um, the International Food Policy Research Institute from Washington. A number of other partners and networks under this, for example, Ecosystem Services Partnership, headed also by Bob Costanza, VOCAT is uh, very close friends with us, and um, the CGIR um, institutions are um, getting engaged as well there. So there is, as I said, a strong network being established there and we'd like to widen this up. So whatever you see a chance from your institution there or from your organization or from your enterprise to come in here and to find it interesting, do not hesitate to contact me on this.
support is through a number of uh, sources there, directly to our partner institutions, directly to us from partner institutions. Um, we provide support, funding, and um, expertise to a number of case study activities as well on the basis of this gap analysis there. So, and the timing for us is to go out with tools and reports by beginning to mid next year. Why? Because that's politically sensible. Next year there'll be the discussions on the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals coming up. Next year is the year of soil, International Year of Soil. So the United Nations have recognized the growing threat here as well and um, are reacting in a way which is suitable for the United Nations, I guess, um, trying to raise awareness for the issue there. We will use this opportunity and come up with arguments, materials, outputs for ELD. Because, you see, ELD is very much a science policy interface project or initiative there. Working with partners from both pillars there and bringing this together is the core task of the ELD Secretariat. It is being managed, we are being managed, we being the Secretariat team, being managed through a steering group of our partners and we are getting help as well from senior advisors and experts from an advisory group of economists, politicians, people who know how and where to place a message to raise the maximum awareness with our results and make the results before that very robust so that there is no way out except for accepting um, what ELD is being preparing and um, including our data in better decision making. In the, end. the ELD MOOC and the ELD initiative, um, why did we get there? Because um, I think our colleagues from GIZ pointed this out as a very good opportunity, A, to share ELD content with interested participants, and B, to reach out to a number of new, part, uh, new partners or new interested people or organizations through the MOOC there. And I must admit, I find this astonishing, really, the result. We had more than 1,500 uh, registrations so far, I think, through the MOOC. Lots of you being professionals and um, scientists with the background um, very closely related to land degradation, economics of land degradation even. And uh, the MOOC seems to be a very suitable instrument um, for bringing you all together here and um, allowing for an interaction and an exchange between um, these professionals there. Thanks to the colleagues from GIZ and setting this up, it seems a very good platform here so far, and I'm looking forward to the overall process of the MOOC there as well. Well, and um, we'll be following from the Secretariat, we'll be following the MOOC process throughout the next 11, 10 weeks from now on. Um, thank you all for joining us here, and thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak to you today. Please do not hesitate to contact us if there's any questions or so coming up. Have a look at our website from time to time. It's being renewed at this moment by uh, our team here. And um, we'll keep you updated through that, through these ways on the development of the ELD initiative as well. There's so much coming up there. Stay with us for a while. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Mark, for sharing uh, some background information about the ELD initiative with us. Um, some of you asked whether the presentation will be recorded. Yes, it will be recorded. So uh, here is the opportunity to um, uh, hear more about the initiative uh, 
uh, when looking at the recording that will be made available uh, soon after this meeting. Um, and uh, somebody asked whether there's written information on the ELD initiative. Yes, there is. There is uh, some information uh, also presenting the organization structure uh, on the MOOC website. You found it under the MOOC. Uh, there's information on uh, the uh, structure, the, the, the development, um, so that's available there. And you may also want to look at the ELD's website itself. So, and that's currently being uh, renewed. I see that some more people have joined us. Marta, Maria from Argentina um, uh, and others. Uh, I see that uh, we'll take questions after, uh, questions from the chat uh, later on, but uh, there is one that asked for the relationship between ELD and UNCCD. Uh, Mark, do you want to pick up on that one before I hand over to Emmanuel? Yeah, thank you. I just wanted to type an answer, but this is uh, quicker and maybe to go through the microphone. Um, UNCCD is one of our founding partners for the ELD initiative and um, they allow us access to the international negotiations and um, international exchanges as well. UNCCD has been very helpful in that case, facilitating our access and uh, um, facilitating the access <coughs> sorry, of ELD results to decision makers on international United Nations level now as well. Okay, thanks, Mark. Uh, I see uh, we have people joining us uh, from Senegal. Bonjour. Uh, Where is for our French speaking uh, participants? Uh, bonjour et uh, bienvenue à notre course. Um, I will now hand over to Dr. Emmanuel Kileru, who will introduce us to uh, the ELD methodology. Hi again, everyone. It's a real pleasure to be here. I hope um, I hope you will find this presentation interesting, and from your uh, contributions on the MOOC forums already, it looks very. Um, very good and very motivating for us to see all these very good inputs. And uh, I wanted to thank, as, as Mark did, um, the the people at GIZ that made it possible for the MOOC to be um, to be set up. And uh, I hope you'll find this experiment uh, interesting, and I hope you learn a lot from it. Um, and I hope I hope to learn a lot myself from it. So really looking forward to um, seeing it develop as the weeks go by. Um, just just because I've seen a couple of comments about non-native speakers, um, I don't think most most people attending the MOOC are native English speakers, and that includes myself. Um, so again, just feel free to ask questions again and read the written material uh, in relation to the initiative and play the videos again and again, and um, hopefully <laughs> it will make it easier for you. Um, so I'll, I'll, um, my, my side of the presentation focuses on the ELD approach. Uh, and this is what's been in, put into the ELD interim report. So you should be able to have a little bit more details about the slides I'm going to present in the interim report. Um, basically, the, um, the ELD approach is a cost-benefit analysis. And um, it is based on the total economic value of the ecosystem services derived from land. Um, what it means is that we're having a look at what land provides us, and then we estimate their total economic value, whether they have a price or not. Um, so it's the value that society derives from it. And then we compare the cost of action to the benefits from action. Um, focusing on adoption of sustainable land management. And if the benefits, the economic benefits are greater than the cost, then economics says that we should take action because it's economically worth it. And the, um, the methodology that was adopted for the ELD 
has six steps to try and estimate the economic benefits and the cost of action, plus one, which is basically taking action. And that's the one that people should keep in mind, because that's the end goal. Um, so the first, um, the first of the six steps, um, the, I should I should say that these six steps um, are taken from or were established by John Susan and um, Stacy Knoll. Uh, Stacy being one of the ELD working group leaders, as Mark um, mentioned earlier, and um, they've. Um, Oops, I'll try and get back to the slide. Um, these these uh, these six steps were identified um, um, by 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 these two people. Um, so you, if you have any questions, I'm sure Stacy will will be um, able to uh, comment on them as well as other people involved in the ELD initiative. Um, the very first step is called inception. That's um, basically the very, very cru one of the crucial stages in the process. It basically involves uh, knowing the people you're dealing with, the problems they're facing, the scale of the problem, the specific geographical boundaries, the different land covers of um, the area that you want to study. And you can go about it by um, or through a structured process of consultations. And I think Anne, who's around here as well, has um, got some um, um, consultations that will be piloted very soon in Africa. Uh, so again, she might be able to interact with you a little bit more on that. Um, the second step, uh, so once you know who you're dealing with, the geographical context, Um, the social context as well, because that's also important, and the economic context, then you can have a look at the geographical characteristics. So that's the typically the spatial distribution of the ecosystem services that you get. Um, so for that, you can use the geographical information system. And you can have um, either you reuse existing sources or set up a participatory process to gather geographical information. Uh, this is mostly to identify trends and land resources and key patterns, and also to derive some implications of adoption of different sustainable land management approaches, um, and how these would change the ecosystems and the ecosystem's values when they're adopted. Um, so again, it's mostly forward-looking, and it, it has to do with the scenario analysis. Um, the third step is an identification of the types of ecosystem services. Um, you don't have to identify or estimate the value for all ecosystem services, but you have to be able to identify the most relevant ones um, so that you can include them in the assessment. And ecosystem services that are relevant are either because they're relevant either because they've got a widespread distribution or because they've got a high magnitude of benefits. Um, so these are two aspects that you can include um, just to decide whether the ecosystems should be included in your analysis or not. Um, religious and you know spiritual and cultural services are a little bit more difficult to value economically. I mean, it's it's very difficult for people to put a dollar number on, you know, how much they value um, something because of their religion. Um, that's usually set aside and not fully considered an economic analysis. Um, also, there's the the uh, there's another aspect when uh, economic analysis tends to deal with incremental values. So it's value from a change. It's not the absolute value, and uh, that's something you need to be aware of when you do you know, when you go about doing some cost benefit analysis. Um, um, the fourth step is um, about identifying the role of these ecosystem services and community livelihoods and economic valuation. Um, depending on the scale of the study, um, you can rely more on macroeconomics approaches or types of analysis, or you could rely on 
on more microeconomics types of analysis and um, focusing on community livelihoods rather than macroeconomic level. Both of them are important. Um, the emphasis that you need to get between the two will depend on the scale of your analysis and again the relevance to your analysis. Um, and that will be for you to try and figure out and decide, um, possibly with stakeholders, uh, because they <laughs> might be um, good people to work with. Um, the fifth step is about identifying the types of land degradation, the patterns, the different patterns and the different pressures. And that's to mostly assess future risks and vulnerabilities. And again, that's forward looking and um, will be featured into scenarios and will help you project into the future um, different impacts um, so that you can refine your analysis accordingly and make it match reality better. Um, and then the sixth step is the undertaking of the cost-benefit analysis itself and make a decision on whether you should take action or not um, with the final step being taking action. <laughs> Um, so I know Claudia had a question set up, uh, which of the six steps do you consider difficult to do? Um, yes. Do you want to take I, back over, Claudia? Yes, actually I prepared a nice set of questions, but somewhat they disappeared in the digital nirvana. So uh, I was wondering, maybe you could write that uh, down in the chat, which of the six steps do you consider difficult? I will go back to the uh, six steps so uh, you have the chance to look at them. Um, so which of the six steps do you consider difficult in uh, evaluating. So I see here step three, which would be ecosystem services, four and five. Yes, step three, two. Yes. Step one, uh, step four and six, that would be livelihoods. Yes, cost benefit analysis. Um, Florin is saying step four because there are huge differences in people's perceptions. Adi is saying yes, to take action, that's probably the most difficult uh, uh, step to do. Um, there is um, step four, step six. Maybe Emma, would you like to comment? on uh, which uh, steps uh, you found uh, difficult doing? Um, I don't really know. I think the, the crucial one really is to know your context really well. Um, and then in terms of the method, it depends on who you can talk to and get help from. Uh, but really knowing the people that you're dealing with and making it relevant is really the difficult part for me. Okay. Um, if I may uh, but it's say good to know. And I, I, this, the course script... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry, sorry. This co the course script will focus on different focuses on different method for economic valuation, and that will be involved into step four, the role of ecosystem services and community livelihoods in economic valuation. Um, so you can have a look at the material available on the MOOC at that time. And then the last step, the cost-benefit analysis, will be detailed a little bit in the core script as well. So you can get some guidelines on how to do it and hopefully the assignments will help you out and doing them in groups will um, help you with these two aspects. Yeah, I mean, uh, 
uh, when we prepared the MOOC, we were aware that uh, in in many cases it will be difficult to uh, raise all the data that you would need. Uh, so we'll do some. Uh, we'll have some as assignments working. Have you working on? On projects where you will uh, do cost benefit analysis without having all the um, data available, but uh, which will give you um, um, an idea of how to uh, get data, even if um, they may have um, a, a limited uh, value, but will give you some idea of what uh, stakeholders. Uh, will want. We'll also have a speaker next week who will talk about it and uh, others uh, talking about ev evaluation methods um, uh, in in the later uh, live events. Mm. So, um, there uh, let me just just briefly check um, the chat. Um, I saw that uh, the MOOC team has put a slide up um, and has put together three questions that came up in the chat and I would like uh, Mark Schauer or Emmanuel uh, comment on those. Uh, let me re just read question one. It seems uh, this would be more challenging with private sector representatives. How do you approach the decision makers from the private sector? I guess that's a question for Mark. Ciao. Yes, thank you. Mark, please. Um, yes, it is uh, more difficult to engage private sector representatives, but they as well seem to understand that, especially for um, enterprises working in the agribusiness section, um, that they are working and dealing with a non renewable resource, which is the basis for the production of their well, of the main products, right? And in addition to that, um, you could see a smallholder farmer as a private sector representative as well. And he'd be interested in his smaller um, sphere of influence, though, um, to, um, to act according to the sustainable approaches as well and keep and manage these resources which are crucial for his uh, livelihood as well. Yeah, so we're engaging them through um, a specific, uh, a specifically designed uh, report in the end, but um, through a preparation process already, as I said, we'll have uh, the next workshop with uh, representatives from this um, section next week here in Bonn in cooperation with the World Business Council for Sustainable Development who are an umbrella organization for a number of agri um, enterprises there as well. So it's it's a challenge but obviously necessary to bring them on board as well because they are major players in this field. So uh, from what I understand your approach is uh, to say that uh, it's in the uh, business interest, uh, in the interest of the business of the private sector themselves uh, uh, to look at land degradation and uh, to prevent this. Would you have a, uh, uh, an example? Um, if you, um, maybe, would it, if you don't mind, then I will uh, point forward uh, the examples which we have put out on our uh, website there. Um, there are a number of examples specifically designed or specifically worked out from um, from the private sector context there. They are taken out of a business brief which we have prepared so far and um, they provide examples from 
um, all over the world basically and from different sectors and sections as well um, in a way where sustainable man management in the end paid off and investment in this um, sustainable management in the end paid off there. There's more is than there, one example there, which I could discuss. Is, is there one case that you particularly like? Is there one case? Um, Agribusinesses working with Indian farmers on water management, for example. Um, agri in Morocco, working in the preservation of um, of stands of argan oil trees. Um, the um, there is um, examples from. Mango farmers from India working with the Coca-Cola industry, so smallholder farmers and big businesses being connected there as well. Um, larger scale investments into a rural landscape in Portugal where um, the re-irrigation of land has contributed to um, uh, the stop or the, the decrease of um, land degradation as well and increased um, the livelihoods of the people living there as well. So there's a lot available there. No favorite example okay. for me. <laughs> you love them all. <laughs> okay, thanks. I love them all. Uh, and Mark. Can I say something more? So if there is something Go ahead. from Go ahead. the spirit. Okay, if there's something coming up to your mind from the sphere of influence from you guys participating from uh, uh, from all over the world there or so, let us know. We're collecting this and we are publishing this and we are um, communicating these examples to decision makers. So if there's a good example coming up there and you think, oh, maybe this is interesting in the context of the ELD initiative, do not hesitate and send it to us. They'll be thankful for that. Thanks. Okay, the ELD initiative has prepared a business brief that uh, contains a number of um, examples uh, from various countries with various companies. So you may want to have a look at that. We'll put that up on the website. And I'm seeing that uh, Mr. Richard Thomas is just uh, writing that Nestle and Unilever have also examples uh, from their perspectives on their web uh, website so you may want to yeah. look at those so thank you for taking up question one question two I think that's uh, one for uh, Dr. Kiluru uh, the question is in your opinion is the action or benefit cost analysis analysis always a sound method what if the cost of action is more than the benefits of action action yet the land is still a valuable ecosystem how would you recommend Emmanuel it's an excellent question <laughs> you um, um, yeah the the benefit cost analysis isn't always the right tool to assess um, what you have to do sometimes you have to take a more political approach or a more scientific approach uh, rather than an economic one um, but so far in terms of land degradation the science has an uh, is around I mean a lot of um, a lot of there's a lot of of evidence about different sustainable land management practices that is available um, but it hasn't really made a difference in terms of um, the scale of adoption it's still fairly limited and so this initiative is trying to try it's trying a different um, disciplinary approach using economics to try and you know add up to the science evidence to make a case for adopting sustainable land management and um, part of the context analysis, I mean, the very first step, the inception step, um, is also to have a look at the political context, the legal context, and make sure that everything is aligned so that it all works out. <laughs> so it's uh, um, we're, we're using cost-benefit analysis as a tool, but it's not the only one that could be used, and um, it's certainly not an exclusive um, approach. 
Um, so I hope I've answered the first uh, part of the question. Um, um, you can make it sound by just using very um, uh, rigorous methods to try and do the cost-benefit analysis and make it fit the the context that you're trying to assess. Um, so I think being rigorous is part of making it sound. Um, even though it's not always, it, it might be necessary, but it's not always sufficient uh, as an approach. Um, so what if the cost of action is more than the benefits of action? It's um, <laughs> a good question. Then maybe the action you're considering may not be the right one for the people you're working with. So you might want to have a look at a different action. Um, so maybe you know if adopting sustainable land management practice for agriculture doesn't work out, then maybe you want to um, convert your land to being a game park or something completely different. Um, but that would allow to manage your land more economically sustainably. Um, so again, that's um, that's one one feature that you're one way to look at it. And uh, it doesn't mean that the land is not valuable anymore. It just means that the action you want to take doesn't bring more benefits than its cost. Uh, so it's not economically worth it. Um, but it may become economically worth it if the government puts in subsidies uh, or tries and facilitate um, adoption because there's a you know, general recognition that this is the right way to go about it. So even if it's not economically desirable um, through a first assessment, there, there are a range of different ways. Sound is back again. Um, okay, I'm not sure. I think Emma is speaking. Um, sound seems to be a problem, but sounds from Emma is not working. Um, transmission problems from uh, Canada. Um, no sound there, so what we do. Um, mm. There are some um, questions or comments on values, but uh, Emma's sound is not working, but maybe I can ask uh, Mark Schauer then uh, to comment on question number three. Yep, happy to do so. Can you hear Mark, me? Mark, okay? would you like to comment on question number three? How do you pro approach evaluating um, cultural and religious services? Okay, thanks for the feedback. Um, not all values would need a, um, a monetary valuation system behind it if you want. Um, Cultural and religious service, there is, if you want, the quantitative and the qualitative assessment to that. Um, some of you might have had a chance to have a look at the TEEB approach, for example, the ecosystem, um, the economics of ecosystems and biodiversity there. Um, there is an explanation there which shows that um, qualitative values can be in the end as powerful and as useful as quantitative and um, 
more correct in its way as well. So often cultural and religious services would go through, uh, the valuation of cultural and religious services could go through the, uh, um, through a qualitative uh, valuation process there. I don't know if Emma has already come back here and can hear me okay. Maybe you want to add to that what I just said. Emma may need to check her mic there. So. Um, I'm not sure whether Emma's uh, 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 microphone is working. Uh, she's back, so we try to listen to her. Um, there was a question uh, on a comment on question uh, two, whether the cost benefit analysis is a private uh, undertaking in the sense uh, of of looking at individual costs for a private um, undertaking or f a cost benefit analysis for um, society. Maybe Emma, Emma, could you make the point whether the cost-benefit analysis is rather um, um, an individual undertaking or a society's perspective? Oops, sounds. Or Mark, would you like to comment on that? Any chance here? Okay. Um, not necessarily um, a individual approach, if you want. There, um, this can be run by organizations, and obviously, um, this is a general approach which could also be undertaken by political for political decisions to be taken. Um, the cost and and the benefits you derive from an investment, for example. Um, can be compared in small scale as well as in large scale investment from states as well as from a smallholder farmer to take that example again. So that is not necessarily restricted to just a smaller individual scale. We can do this with, as I said, investment on constructions, on the um, on buildings on um, on exactly on investing in uh, stopping land degradation there and seeing the benefits deriving from it um, in agricultural um, surroundings for example that is something which is done on a large scale not necessarily on a farmers level and still works on the cost benefit analysis. Okay. Emma doesn't okay, seem a... to be able to come in, so maybe yeah. I can take on if there's any questions yeah. coming up. There's another question on uh, yeah. how uh -huh. you, you're doing that uh, analysis. Uh, it says, do you guys work with statistical analysis or creating models? Can I come in? Emma has just given a very good um, comment here. I'm saying that it's important to adopt a rigorous approach to cost-benefit analysis to make it as sound as possible, that is necessary on all levels there. And um, we work on models. I explained in the beginning that there is um, a specific working group with us um, on scenarios there. So, because we think that for decision makers it's very important that we show um, scenarios and more, or that we work on models as well, and so we can show scenarios how it would look like if you take this or that pathway, um, or if you choose this or that option there. So this is important for us. Um, nevertheless, sure, we work uh, on statistic um, on the basis of statistics there as well. This is what why we had created the gap analysis uh, in the beginning and where we are looking to fill the gaps which we had identified there as well. So, um, again, as Emma has explained before, it depends a bit also on the context. Yeah. Okay. You will have the opportunity to um, uh, 
bring in all these questions also uh, when we are doing a, um, a case study, a study of your own case, and you'll be able uh, to decide which perspective is uh, worth taking. Um, I think at this point we'll be able to take a couple of more questions uh, and we could open the microphone for some of you. If you have a microphone and um, you want to raise a question, you may uh, raise your hand, uh, which is um, that little hand on top of, uh, at the very top of the screen. There's a little hand, so if you have a question and uh, would like uh, to open uh, your microphone, we'd be happy to do so. We take uh, two or three questions. If you do have a microphone and would like to ask something, so raise your hand if that is the case. Um, um, so here we've got one question and I'll be opening uh, the microphone for uh, Susie. I think she was the first uh, to raise uh, the hand. Um, no, uh, um, so if you want to raise your hand, otherwise we'll t take a couple of more questions. Oh, there's Susie in the um has opened her webcam but i can't hear her uh right now um uh, i'm not sure whether the audio is working otherwise um is susie is that, is that you um, can you hear me yes sort of Okay. Yes, I can. You can clearly. Okay. Um, I hope I hope it's audible to everybody. Um, yes. I was just wondering. Uh, I apologies. I may have missed some some of your presentation because I came in halfway through. But text of decision makers, and it may have something to to do with. It may share something to do with question three. While modeling is important when um, trying to get decision makers to see the options available, but do you, how do we incorporate sort of, sort of um, country contexts, I suppose, or African contexts? Or, you know, um, maybe let me use Kenya as an example. Um, a lot of the, we have, uh, uh, almost 85, 84% arid land. But then we also have forests, um, forest areas, highlands, and coastal areas. And all those areas do get degraded. So, depending on who the decision maker is, if 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 their preference or focus is on the assals. Um, the same. I don't know. Would the, would the model translate if you if you're trying to get buy-in for um, addressing degradation in the highlands, for example, in the coastal area? I don't know if if, if okay. I, I may not be phrasing my question correctly, but do you understand what it is I'm trying to say? In other words, can we can the modeling um, translate across the different scenarios where degradation um, occurs in the country context? Okay, so here's a question of um, about how uh, ELD may take the country context into consideration. Uh, Susie raised the uh, question of Kenya, where um, much of the land is deg degraded, and uh, so how would that country context uh, work? Um, with the ELD approach. Mark, would you like to comment on it? 
Um, maybe on the overall approach, um, you might see that there is um, um, a friend and partner of ours involved in, or who was involved in the chat here. Her name is Anna Yupna. She's working for UNDP. And Anna is organizing a policy dialogue within um, um, Eastern Africa f in the context of the ELD initiative. This includes Kenya. So this means that we are engaging decision makers in specific countries there with ELD arguments and um, trying to initiate a dialogue with relevant decision makers on different levels there, on national level as well as on regional level. Um, so we take the country specific legal systems and financial tools which are in use there. Um, taxes for example, other financial incentives on board in our, um, in our discussion with decision makers and in the valuation processes there. Um, Often it does not make sense to follow method on a methodological way to follow country borders there if you want because the relevant ecosystems and also um, the management of these um, regions, areas or so is being done cross across the border for pastoral lists in Africa for example. So, so um, it's more the um, it's more the borders, if you want, of different ecosystems, which are important, and not the political borders in the methodological approaches, but in discussions with decision makers. There, um, Anna is the one to go to, and um, ELD is certainly engaging in these policy dialogues through um, our options and pathways for action working groups. Uh, Maybe Anna would come up with a comment in the chat as well if she's still on board. A little bit later in Kenya already. Uh, thank you, Mark. Uh, I would like to take another question from Hong Hao, who has um, raised his hand. So I'll open the microphone to another question. Um, Meanwhile, I would like to say that we'll put up the questions in uh, the forum. Um, I don't, there are more raised hands. I will call on um, the next hand. So, who would like to raise one more question? Um, if you are upper speaking, you need to click on that little red microphone button. Um, if you want to talk. Um, but, so, uh, let's try again. Okay, we are waiting for the next uh, question. Um, yes. Um, are we having another question here? Um, there's, I see more raised hands. Um, but um, okay, I th think we should continue this in the forum there be more opportunities so we take uh, Susie's question once again 
Um, there's one more question. Um, so if you want to open the mic, otherwise I would suggest that we continue in the forum that will give us the opportunity to really uh, relate uh, to each other. Okay. Can you hear me? Um, yes. Okay, um, sure, climate change, I had raised it and several other people had raised it. So um, possibly you, um, either Emmanuel or Mark, you might want to respond to that. Because the issue of, um, uh, well, the issue I had raised in the forum was ELD versus uh, adaptation mitigation actions particularly um, red, red plus. And uh, somebody else um, is bringing up, is also asking about how do we relate this to climate change issues. So it, in whatever context you would like to look at it, but from the CC perspective, I suppose, I suppose not only just the CCD perspective. I, I hope <laughs> it was a general question almost, but I, I hope you understand the, the context of what I'm saying. I'm not sure about the acronym. CCD is the Convention to Combat Desertification, and then you had CD. Yes. I think the question was one that came up in the forum as well. What is the relationship between ELD initiative and uh, climate change? How does that relate? I can, I can go for it, Mark, if you want. Because um, I've commented on, on that comment already in the discussion area, so I don't know if you've seen my post. So we're not touching on climate change as such, uh, but because it's a factor that increases variability and, and the trends, future trends, it will be embedded into the scenarios that will be considered by the ELD. And uh, just, just because of that increased variability um, and... I mean, payment for ecosystem services such as carbon payments are one option for action, or one instrument that can be taken and that can be set up. And this is already part of the options that were considered by the ELD initiative, but it's not a focus on addressing climate change issues. It's more a focus on trying to promote sustainable land management, thereby trying to mitigate climate change impacts. I hope, I hope that makes sense. Especially, <clears throat> sorry, can I come in here quickly? Especially with um, UNFCCC's um, initiative or activities to facilitate land restoration there, um, there will be a closer cooperation with the UNCCD and with, um, with land restoration issues in general as well. And this is where ELD, um, through the through the economic approaches there comes in as well, there, as Emma said. Okay, there is, there is one more question from Ghazi, or was that the last one? Otherwise, as I would suggest that we continue in the forum and close this uh, session. We may, st we may stay tuned. Um, a little longer um, for those who want to continue discussing, but for those who need to leave now, um, I would like to say uh, just a few words about this uh, first e event and all the upcoming. Uh, so this was uh, the first event with is Dr. Kilaru and Mark uh, Schauer. Thank you, Emma, and thank you, Mark, for being today's speakers. Thanks to you. Thanks very much. Um, next week, next week uh, we will have uh, Stacy Noel, director of the Africa Center at the Stockholm Environment Institute. And uh, she is currently based in Nairobi and she will talk about ecosystem uh, services and uh, their uh, stakeholders. 
Um, so I'm looking forward uh, to this live event and I hope uh, many of you will join us uh, for another uh, discussion event next week, same time, uh, same place. You may uh, have to uh, register uh, for next week's. Again, we'll put that up um, at the beginning of uh, the week. So, uh, meanwhile, um, stay tuned, go to the forum, the discussion goes on and we'll see you in the forum, Mark and Emma will be commenting in the forum and others from the ELD initiative will do so as well. I'll be looking at forum and checking those as well. So thank you so much for being with us this afternoon, for being uh, with us in the first live event of the ELD MOOC. So have a nice week. Uh, see you soon again online uh, or live uh, in the next event. Bye-bye from Berlin. Bye-bye to all of you. You may want to switch on your webcam. Uh, we may, if you want, uh, I'll, if you want to put on your webcams, um, all cameras on, here's a chance to do so. Oh. Um, so you have the opportunity to wave bye-bye or hello uh, to participants from all over the world. Oh, I see webcams coming up. Nice to see you. Okay, for those who don't have a camera, we've seen you in the chat and we've seen your, we we'll see you online in the MOOC uh, forum. Happy to have had you. I see a thumbs up. Uh, I see Peña from, hello. Nice to see you. <laughs> Um, so thank you for being with us. We'll stay tuned for another couple of minutes. Those of you who want to uh, be part of the discussion, stay tuned. We'll be here for um, some more questions and discussions. Um, it was fun having you in this live event. Bye-bye. See you. Good night for those of you who are ready to go to bed. Have a nice evening for those who whose office time has ended now. See you. See you. Hope to see you next week. Bye-bye. was fun having you. Uh, Here's a question. Do we have to post our questions or comment just in English? I'm sure there'll be someone who would un understand another language. Uh, there's so many uh, people around here, so try it in another language and I think other participants will be happy to translate. Hello, Raphael. I see you in the webcam picture. Hi. Um, bye bye. Dr. Vivek, yes, hello, bye bye. Hey, the comments uh, in the chat. Hello, Sophia, hello, goodbye. <laughs> uh, FM, hello, <laughs> see you. Nice to see you. Hey Santiago. Auf Wiedersehen. Yes. Bye bye. Good. Good luck and good night. Oh, there's a comment from Hong Hao Chen. 
in China we cannot watch YouTube. Yes, we have heard the same um, uh, complaints about uh, coming from Iran. We'll try to figure a, uh, try to figure out a different way of presenting the videos, but um, that's uh, we, we have to get back to you on that. Um, soll ich das die Video zeigen? Yes. Um, danke and bye bye. Uh, there's a question from Magenda. What are the assignments? Hello, uh, everyone. The assignments this is Mark Schauer. I'm the. Oh. This is Mark Schauer. Oh. Um, Magenda, what are the uh, assignments? You will f uh, find the first week's assignment on the MOOC platform. You will see it. Uh, on the MOOC website under um